Hello, my name is Sean Kagan. Welcome to the ADL Task Force on Middle East Minorities Call on a Spark of Hope or Escalating Extremism, Middle East and the Plight of Minorities. Please be aware that this call is being recorded. After we hear from our speakers, there will be an opportunity for Q&A. If you'd like to ask a question at any time during the call, simply open the chat box on the bottom of the Zoom program and type in your question. At this time, I would like to introduce ADL's Senior Vice President for International Affairs and Director of ADL's Task Force on Middle East Minorities, Sharon Nazarian. Thank you, Sean, and thank you to all of you joining us for this important call. Good morning to those on the West Coast, good afternoon to those on the East Coast, and good evening to those in Europe, Iran, Israel, and beyond. Uh, since its establishment in 1913, ADL has been fighting to stop the defamation of Jewish people and to secure just and fair treatment for all in the U.S. and beyond. For that reason, the plight of vulnerable minorities in the Middle East and the challenges they face is an ADL concern and priority. Based on this founding mission, ADL launched its Task Force on Middle East Minorities in 2018 with the goal of educating, advocating, and elevating the issues challenging these important and all too often overlooked communities across the Middle East, including religious, ethnic, sexual, and gender minorities, and other groups who face governmental and societal repression and discrimination. To that end, we work with a stellar group of scholars, journalists, and activists who are experts in what is happening in these minority communities and through their expertise and activism, we work to raise awareness and promote action. Today, I will engage in dialogue with five of our experts. Farahnaz Isfani is a senior fellow at the Religious Freedom Institute and former member of the Pakistan parliament. Shadi Martini, executive director of Multi-Faith Alliance for Syrian Refugees. Ali Reza Nader is a senior fellow at the Foundation of the, for the Defense of Democracies. Sam Tadros is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute, and Tuba Panieri Erdemir is the coordinator for our ADL task force and an expert on religious heritage and minorities in Turkey. Over the last year, major changes have taken place in the Middle East from the US pullout from Northern Syria to the shifting dynamics between Israel and the Gulf states, marked by yesterday's signing of the Israel, UAE, and Bahrain agreements. While COVID-19 pandemic poses unprecedented challenges to governments across the region, some new alliances are formed as ongoing hostilities are deepening, impacting Syria, Iraq, Egypt, Turkey, um, Iran, the Gulf, and their populations, and particularly their vulnerable communities. So today, we'd like to open the panel conversation by turning to Farah Naz to really set up the scene and outline the challenges and opportunities um, today facing communities um, of minority communities in the Middle East. If you could start by telling us a little bit about some of these unprecedented challenges and the opportunities um, that are facing minority communities in the Middle East. Farah Naz, please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, can you hear me clearly? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, let me begin by saying that religious persecution is, of course, not limited to the Middle East. People all over the world are being tortured, sexually violated, and killed just for espousing a faith that is different to that of the majority they live among. Although many of these historic communities have lived there for centuries before and called those regions home. In the case of China's Uyghurs and Myanmar's Rohingyas, Muslims are themselves targets of sustained and targeted religious persecution. We recently observed the International Day of commemorating the victims of acts of violence based on religion or belief. It marked the, la the loss of pluralism across the Middle East and how that loss of pluralism provides a pretext for acts of violence, atrocities, and genocide. 
The goal of religious persecution is often the same. We see that it's to create religious homogene homogeneity and to purify a country of its minorities so that the majority's belief dominate by force. We see the minorities dispossessed, forced out, but the majority too loses the benefit of historic pluralism. If we look at Muslim majority Iraq, it has been the traditional homeland to ancient Christian and Jewish populations until only a century ago. Jews were an important part of the cultural life and commercial life of Baghdad and the small Aramaic speaking ancient Jewish community in Iraqi Kurdistan served as a reminder of the history of the Jews in the Middle East. But the wave of anti-Semitism that started first with the rise of Arab nationalism and radical Islamism in a major way, dehumanized, demonized, and marginalized these Jewish populations. The earlier waves of attacks on Jews and Christians served as the backdrop to the atrocities of ISIS. In societies that had already engaged in acts of violence towards religious minorities, ISIS advanced a totalitarian ideology of hate. ISIS, as we now know, attempted to ethnically cleanse the territory under its control of all non-Muslims. The genocide against Yazidis was part of that wider violence against, uh, of ISIS against non-Muslim minorities, but its ramifications were greater for a relatively small population. As part of the Trump administration's disengagement from foreign wars, the United States also seems to have disengaged from leadership on human rights issues. If President Obama created the vacuum that allowed ISIS to rise in Iraq and Syria, President Trump has seemed okay until now with allowing Russia, Iran, and Turkey to vie for control of the Middle East. I've talked today on the overall situation in the Middle East. However, I must not forget to mention important and ancient communities such as the Coptic Christians of Egypt, the Assyrian Christians, and every other religious minority group barely holding on in spite of war and persecution in these troubling times. With Turkey and Iran making greater inroads every day into the Arab areas of the Middle East. So we have a lot to be fearful of for the future of um, non-Muslim and persecuted minorities. Now I'm going to turn, as Sharon had asked me to, to opportunities and um, positive openings. And um, I will talk very briefly because I'm just going to lay this out in terms of the opportunity I see it as. Um, I do see what happened yesterday at the White House as a historic occasion. I see the UAE Israel Bahrain Accord as um, positive in many, many ways, including hopefully a way to secure and protect religious minorities who have been wiped out to a great degree in the Arab world. However, you know, looking at history, we have to see that the overall picture did not change with the Egypt-Israel peace treaty in 79. And so we mustn't become complacent. We must keep our eyes on this and follow this very, very carefully. And if we see warning signs, that things may be going amiss within populations or with governments. We have to speak up at that moment. It is a huge step forward, I would say, for the diplomatic picture. But the cultural picture of mainstreaming hate and the acceptance of anti-Semitism and anti-minority culture will not change easily. It is deeply embedded. 
not in the United Arab Emirates, but in the region. Um, we have seen it for hundreds of years and at a great, at a, in a greatly charged atmosphere in recent years. Also, we have to keep in mind too much rise on the extreme pressure on the region. Again, I repeat, from Iran, Turkey, and Russia. What we've witnessed recently in Lebanon also could just be the beginning of the deeper inroads made by Iran and others. And so basically what I'm saying is these entrenched attitudes towards a religious minority populations um, we can't at this moment relax. We really have to focus and um, be very wary. So overall, I would say the up, upside of it is we can definitely view the UAE-Israel Accord as a positive step forward from the diplomatic lens, but the overall cultural picture of the continuation of mainstreaming hate and the widespread societal acceptance of anti-Semitism, anti-Christian, as well as of those ancient religions and peoples like the Yazidis also exists today. And while we congratulate the UAE and Bahrain, and especially the UAE with the establishment of the Abrahamic ha house with the synagogue, church and mosque within it, um, and um, the yesterday His Highness Abdullah bin Zayed spoke of normalization and that Israel and the UAE have already begun an energetic cooperation in many fields. But what I think the Arab street will focus on, um, which I, Sam will, um, who is an expert in this, will talk about, he said very clearly, His Highness said that progress on Palestinian statehood also will remain central, that the accord stopped annexation and that the pace and scope of normalization will not be disconnected from progress on Palestinian statehood and rights. So I feel that needed to be said, we must bear in mind there's still a great deal of sympathy and support and concern for Palestinian people in the broader region and we can have political differences on this issue, but the support does exist. And so while one does take heart at the opening on the diplomatic front, we have to make a distinction between the diplomatic and what lies embedded within those societies and needs to change. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you, Farnas. That was a fantastic setting the table for us and really laying out both the historical and, and current challenges I do want to turn to you, Sam, and for us to give us, for you to give us the lens from the minority perspective. Tell us a little bit about how you see these changes impacting not only the region as a whole, the way Farinas has laid it out, but specifically from the perspective of minority Christian and other religious communities. Are you hopeful about these changes? Thank you, Sharon. Well, of course, everyone has to be hopeful with the prospect of peace. I think there are a few points to be made first about the accords themselves and the idea of peace between those two countries or normalizing relations with Israel. Um, I think first, uh, it shows very clearly that the, the whole Arab boycott movement of Israel is completely dead. Uh, the thing was a farce since the very beginning, starting with boycotts of Jewish businesses in um, uh, mandate Palestine before even the establishment of the state and um, being involved in boycotts of Marlene Monroe and Elizabeth Taylor because of their positions on Israel or boycotting movies because there was a horse called Samson in a movie and that's supposedly a pro-Israeli stance. But now we really see the end of this whole force. People are tired of this. People don't see a use of that. Secondly, I think the end of the use of the Palestinian issue to divert people from their actual interests and needs. Um, all this talk about the UAE and Bahrain betraying the Arab cause assumes an Arab cause that no longer exists in the minds of the people in the region. People in the region look for their own interests and will f look for what serves this interest no matter where. I think also an important point to be made is how <clears throat> Bahrain is, in a sense, much more courageous in taking this decision than the UAE. 
while in the UE the population is in line with the leadership's direction or view of the UE's position in the world and its overall policies, in Bahrain we have a population that disagrees dramatically with the way the monarchy runs the country. We have a population that part of which is beholden to Iranian propaganda, part of which is of course uh, the Sunni population naturalized partly by the Bahrainian government in order to create a population balance from countries, from people that are antagonistic to a relationship to Israel. Even the, within the native Sunni Bahraini population, the regime often finds itself allied with uh, Muslim Brotherhood parties and operatives with Arab nationalists in order to balance the Shia majority, which it uh, persecutes and, and attempts to control. So all of these actors will be completely against this idea of Bahrain joining the peace treaty. Nonetheless, I think that this idea of peace um, is very different from the one that we've had with Egypt and Jordan in the past. In the case of Egypt and Jordan, the regime signed the peace agreement, yet the population was completely absent from it. Even the regimes did not welcome, especially in the Egyptian case, any contact between uh, the, the population and Israel beyond what was controlled completely by them. The, the relationship was something to be had, unfortunately, because that was the reality of geopolitics, but it was not something that the population or even other elements of society would participate on. Uh, this is very different in this case. We're going to see a very warm peace. We're going to see really normal relations in terms of especially the UAE and Israel, which brings me to the very important point that before this peace agreement was reached, it required a road of toleration first. Before people came to accept Israel, they had to accept the idea of differences, of that societies are not made of one color first, and the idea of Jews as belonging in the region. A former Bahraini foreign minister made the statement that Israel is part of the heritage of the region, that the Jewish uh, community, the Jewish people have a place amongst us. This mentality was necessary before such a peace was to be reached. We saw it in Bahrain, which has a local Jewish population in the form of having members of parliament from that Jewish population. The former Bahraini ambassador to the US, Udanunu, was a Jew. We have all this acceptance, celebration of, of Jewish um, occasions and holidays, uh, participation by the Bahraini government in those celebrations, in the UE, in the toleration that we've seen of religious minorities, in this welcoming of the idea of religious diversity. I think that's a key component that, yes, there is an element of uh, Iranian threat and Turkey's threat and how these regimes perceive them. There's a struggle with Qatar. There are a lot of geopolitical issues involved, but it's before that had to, uh, that peace or that agreement was to be signed, the toleration, the acceptance of minorities was a necessary step. Thank you, Sam. That's really, uh, uh, really great, great insight and helpful for us now to turn to the other side of the map which those regimes who are not excited about these changes. And first and foremost in that line, Ali is Iran. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of both the geostrategic dimension of um, Iran and how it perceives its role in the Middle East, um, how uh, yesterday's uh, ceremony uh, is being you know, taken in by the Iranian regime, but also about Iran's own uh, minorities, how this regime has, um, uh, brought about all the oppression and, and treatment of its own religious, um, um, sexual, um, uh, ethnic minorities in Iran. Uh, tell us a little bit about the Iranian dynamic, please. Thank you for inviting me to speak, uh, Sharon, and uh, hi, uh, everybody at ADL uh, and on the panel. Uh, it's a real honor. Sorry if there's background noise, by the way, the house next to mine is being renovated. Uh, no but. I think you asked a very great question. Uh, the accord yesterday signed at the White House is bad news for the Islamic Republic in Iran because uh, increasingly 
uh, both the people of Iran and uh, much of the region, especially the Arab world, have rejected the Islamic Republic's approach toward Israel and uh, the Israel-Palestinian issue, which is really defined by arming groups like uh, Hamas and a number of other groups like Islamic Jihad. Uh, so it's a model of armed resistance and increasingly it's under severe pressure, both from within uh, communities in these countries that are controlled by the Islamic Republic, like Iran, Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, um, and the wider region. And so I think if you're an Iranian, and we've seen this on the streets of Iran for the past three years, uh, you're more likely to resent this uh, policy of resistance from the Islamic Republic. And look at the rest of the region, which looks like it's moving forward. You know, um, the countries that have signed the agreement are more technologically and economically advanced. And what uh, Iran's dictator Ayatollah Khamenei uh, has been saying for decades uh, in terms of Israel going away and uh, uh, Jerusalem being conquered through force um, and military arms, it uh, has proven to be completely false. And this comes uh, at a very bad time for the regime in Iran. As you very well know, uh, the regime just executed a very young 27-year-old uh, wrestler uh, Navid Afkoi, um, he was made to confess under torture and there are reports that he died under torture and wasn't even executed. Uh, but this is a regime that's trying to create fear uh, in Iran and elsewhere uh, because it is very unstable, uh, has faced two major uprisings and uh, demonstrations across the country uh, in the last three years. The economy is sinking. Um, and so there's a real climate fear, a climate of fear in Iran, um, as is elsewhere, you know, we see it also elsewhere in Syria and Lebanon and Iraq, um, to different scale. And in terms of minorities, you know, the minorities uh, of Iran suffer the most, typically, um, especially during this time of uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, but also in the last few years, uh, especially since uh, Hassan Rouhani became president, uh, there's been a real crackdown on minorities like the Baha'is, uh, the Christians especially, um, and uh, other ethnic and religious minorities. The list goes on and on and on. Uh, we, know we could talk hours about the, the groups if you uh, combine all of them. Uh, but minorities are faring the worst. Interestingly, you know, we see a lot of reports and surveys suggesting that um, the religious identity of Iranian society has dramatically changed uh, since the 1979 revolution. There was just a recent survey that I thought was very interesting. It was by this uh, group called uh, Gamon, and they surveyed thousands of Iranians to see um, how they define themselves in terms of religion. And 32% uh, identified as Shia Muslim, and I, I think about 5% as Sunni. So maybe about 40% of the population uh, identifies as uh, Muslim. But um, tellingly, a, a majority of the population either believed itself to be atheist or secular or cr growingly Christian. Uh, yeah, even Zoroastrian, 8%. Um, so, uh, re you know, religious identity in Iran has changed, but the, the regime is still based on this very extreme uh, religious I ideological identity uh, that it's um, forced on the population. Uh, I think... To finish off, the key issue for the regime in Iran right now is the U.S. presidential election. The media in Iran covers it extensively. And um, if I think the feeling is if the 
if there's another Trump administration that the policy of maximum pressure could continue and increase. And if there's a Biden president, let's see, uh, as um, Biden has said, the objective would be to go back into the JCPOA with potential um, incentives for the Islamic Republic up front. Um, so that's where we're at. I think the regime is very unstable. The climate of fear will increase. Uh, the killing, I think, of a wrestler, because the regime would know the reaction given the popularity of the sport in Iran. It's probably the most popular traditional sport. Uh, I think it's just a message to the public that if uh, you don't obey us, you face death. And we've seen thousands of uh, executions and imprisonments and uh, torture uh, in the last year. Um, and I think that's what we can really expect from Iran. Just, uh, I, I don't think there's a ray of hope yet. I think uh, a lot hangs in the balance in the next few months. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you, Ali, very much for both the kind of the regional and the domestic look into Iran. Um, turning to Shadi, uh, we'd love for you to kind of talk a little bit about this expansive role of Iran um, through the region in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon. Obviously, after the U.S. withdrawal um, from Iraq and northern Syria, Turkey's also you know, come in and um, taken control over areas um, which really are impacting a lot of minorities. Will you kind of tell us a little bit about um, what is happening to minority groups in those three countries and how do you see the current climate for them? Hi, and thank you for inviting me and thanks for ADL for organizing uh, this webinar and to all the people uh, participating. Uh, of course, the U.S. disengagement uh, had an opening for two regional powers, uh, Iran and Turkey. Also, two regional powers that have not been as aggressive as each other. You know, Turkey came in a little bit late to the game because of its uh, politics, its different political system. It had uh, a lot of engagement with the West. It's a member of NATO, so there was a different approach uh, from Turkey. But Iran, since the U.S. Uh, was planning to withdraw from Iraq, uh, was very aggressive in affecting the policies and results of uh, elections in, uh, in Iraq and uh, you know, supporting its uh, clients there. Uh, Iran before that had only one major client, which is uh, Hezbollah, which is a party in Lebanon, but not the government itself. But in Iraq, it had much more influence. And with the Arab Spring and, and the uh, situation in Syria, it's so an opening to expand into Syria with the thought of uh, having a road from Tehran uh, to Beirut to the Mediterranean. But of course, the final aim was to have access to the borders with Israel, that it be southern Lebanon or the Golan Heights. Of course, Iran uh, is trying to export its problems. Uh, the, uh, the situation in Iran is is very difficult, like Ali has said, and this is a way to uh, divert attention from the local populations to uh, other issues using either religious uh, terms or using you know, historical terms. Of course, uh, as polls have shown us, the population in Iran is not happy with that and doesn't believe in this rhetoric, but uh, some segments do believe it, and it's a very populist uh, move also in uh, the neighboring uh, Arab countries. This is, of course, uh, this very aggressive policy from Iran created a lot of uh, tensions in the region. In Iraq, it created tensions with the uh, Arab Sunni minority and also it created tensions with the Kurdish, which is also considered Sunni in northern Iraq. Uh, that led to the rise also of extremist elements on the Sunni front, like ISIS and Al Qaeda. And that's uh, affected the minorities uh, a lot and specifically in the city of Mosul which was where we had a sizable Christian minority specifically Assyrians and other Christian communities. Uh, they were pushed out of the city they had to go to areas that they consider a little relatively more safe like uh, Kurdistan region of Iraq which is uh, a more open and tolerant of their uh, their presence and they have freedom of religion but also also, they were faced with another issue with the 
Turkish incursions into this area with the fight between the, the PKK and the Turkish authority. So um, minorities had it, uh, you know, had it the worst between all these regional uh, powers trying to gain more control and trying to, uh, uh, you know, implement a bigger strategy uh, for the region. And of course, without the with, uh, U.S. withdrawal, none of this would happen. And we saw that also in, in Syria, where Iran is uh, trying to implement a more uh, face uh, transition with a lot of Sunni Arabs in the areas of Bukamal and Deir Zor, where, where they see them as a vital border crossing into, into Syria and its road to Damascus and Beirut and the borders with, with Israel. Now, they had to do that because the U.S. controlled the main border crossing, which is much shorter to Damascus through al Tanaf. So we have to see the connections between U.S. policy and Iran aggressiveness and way of how it deals with its strategy to secure its influence across the region. Now, Turkey comes in the picture as it uh, shows that uh, the Arab enthusiasm for uh, the war with Israel is, is not that big. People were saying that their government were just using this uh, historic conflict just to oppress them and uh, deprive them of economic opportunities. Uh, so here come uh, Iran, which traditionally have held the Shia realm of Islam as a Palestine and Jerusalem and Islamic case. And here comes Turkey to have a counterbalance as the holder of the Sunni case for Jerusalem and Palestine in general. But both of them are using it only to benefit their uh, local politics and their populism among their, their population. So Turkey use it also uh, the Kurdish issue to try to do incursions into Syria. We've seen a lot of pressure on minorities, especially in Northern Syria with issues with water and issues with electricity. So all this expansions from these two regional uh, powers had, had a major negative effect on the local population as a whole and their minorities specifically because minorities are part of this general populations and they are much more vulnerable than the majorities or the bigger minorities in the region. So all, all over it has a very, very negative effect on uh, these countries and their minorities. Thank you. Thank you, Shadi, so much for that. Um, before we turn to Turkey, Farahnaz, I'd like to go back to you and really um, focus on a specific group that has been especially um, um, targeted um, and, and vilified in this area and, and, and damaged in ways that are used, the terms we're using now is genocidal, which is the Yazidis. Can you talk a little bit about um, the plight of the Yazidis right now in the Middle East, where they're standing, where are the challenges, their ability to come back to their homes? Where is, where is their status right now? Thank you, Sharon. Um, when we look at where we are um, with the Yazidi community, it is a very, very sad, um, sad situation in so many ways. Um, a mere six years after the genocide conducted by the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, commonly referred to as ISIS, against a small and very vulnerable Yazidi community. The Middle East today is even less multicultural and multi-faith than it was at the time of the rise of ISIS in 2012. Um, and the Yazidis, when you look at them historically for this small ancient group, um, in the past have survived 72 earlier attempted genocides and yet managed to stay in their traditional homeland until the advent of ISIS. So what a resilient people. But just so we don't forget, um, not just what the entire Yazidi um, community went through with ISIS, the killing, the brutality, the mass graves, the torture. Um, I do want to focus a little bit today on the Yazidi women. 
Because what we see very often in religious minority communities which are attacked is that minority women are the vulnerable group within the greater vulnerable group, right? Um, in some places you see forced conversions, in some places you see um, sexual violence, in other places, you know, you just see women within these groups as having that double vulnerability. So I'd just like to remind everyone here today of something we need to continue to work towards. We can't forget about the Yazidis just because we're now focusing on the Uyghurs or the Rohingyas or anyone else. Um, I want to remind everyone of what women in particular lived through and are still living through in the Yazidi community. Um, ISIS's Al Khansa Brigade, which was sort of a female religious police unit, which was led by mainly Western women, uh, either converts to Islam or women who were already Muslim, but who came from Western countries to this area and joined ISIS. Um, the Al Khansa Brigade was known for lashing. Um, local Sunni women with cables for dress code infractions, and these are the women that they related to more. They also enforced the caliphate rulings on slave houses, which was like the emblematic institution of ISIS's genocide. The survivors among 6,000 Yazidi and some Christian victims of ISIS slavery have testified firsthand about them. I'm going to quote one or two people because I always find the words of those who lived through them are so much more powerful than those of us speaking on their behalf. A Yazidi advocate called Pari Ibrahim has related, ISIS brides would lock the Yazidi slaves up, slaves up and beat them. They would shower the girls, put them in nice clothes, put makeup on their faces to get them ready to be raped. Um, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Nadia Murad, um, a Yazidi herself who escaped enslavement, has written in her book Last Girl that ISIS women were often crueler than the men and would beat and starve their uh, husband's slaves, Sabaya, out of jealousy or anger or because we are easy targets. An Iraqi Christian, Rita Ayoub, who was liberated from enslavement in 2017, has told of being beaten daily until bloody by a Moroccan jihadi bride in Syria in an effort to force her to convert to Islam. So although, although today, you know, 100,000 Yazidis have returned to their traditional homeland, many still remain in refugee camps. The UN asserts that nearly 3,000 kidnapped women and girls are still missing, and dozens of mass graves have yet to be exhumed. And today, one of the very big issues um, facing the women taken as slaves from among the Yazidis, Yazidi women in particular, who bore children, um, those children have nowhere to go. They're often rejected by the Yazidi communities who say they will welcome back the girls or the women, but they don't want those children of those ISIS extremists. And so we, they, there are a few orphanages with a few of these children, but this among other things is something that we really need to focus on because you know, women are often, even within their own communities, not considered as valuable. So um, basically, um, today where we are with this is Yazidi families attempting to return to their homeland in Sinjar, face the prospect of being caught up in the military competition between regional powers. And this is a very real issue that those of us in the religious freedom uh, community are talking about right now. 
And the American withdrawal from the region has only made the situation for all religious minorities in this area um, harder, which I believe Shadi had um, also mentioned. So Yazidis, Christians, and Shia Muslims uh, whose communities were devastated by ISIS are unlikely to get justice through international decrees, statements, resolutions of the United Nations, unless the US backs them with some form of military might or some form of troops in the region. Um, I'm fearful that this ancient community, um, this ancient community with this ancient religion will barely exist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Farhas, for giving that very sobering assessment. Um, I do want to turn to Turkey because obviously uh, Turkey is an important player. I was on a call with the Emirati foreign minister a couple of days ago and he, in a way that I had kind of not seen before in an unprecedented way, talked about uh, the changes taking place in Turkey under uh, President Erdogan's leadership. Um, Tuba, can you lay out for us a little bit about kind of the geostrategic um, um, uh, uh, situation of how Turkey sees itself given the change uh, yesterday that was commemorated in the White House, but also looking internally, looking domestically within uh, Turkey and how President Erdogan, through uh, the converting of the Hagia Sophia and other um, Christian uh, churches and museums into mosques, how is it internal dynamic also um, taking place in Turkey? Um, thank you, Sharon. Um, let me start by saying uh, that Turkey actually has a great potential to be a role model uh, in the region and had been one for decades, um, albeit in, imperfectly uh, a model for secular democracy with equal citizenship at the core of it. Um, however, its recent um, you know, uh, record is quite problematic. Just yesterday, the United Na Nations Human Rights Council um, published its report on Syria, which includes uh, quite serious uh, comments on Turkey's presence in Syria and Turkey's uh, Turkey-backed proxies uh, violations of human rights. Um, also, Turkey is the only NATO member country to be on the special watch list for uh, violations on minority rights uh, by USERF. Um, let me talk about Hagia Sophia, Hagia Sophia's conversion, and why that's actually an emblematic um, conversion, emblematic event uh, to highlight uh, Turkey's problematic record with its minorities, and why it's alarming in terms of how um, minority rights might be, may be violated uh, in the larger Middle East. Um, Hagia Sophia um, is an ancient monument. It was built in the sixth century as the Byzantine Imperial Church. It was converted into a mosque um, in the 15th century by Mehmet II as a symbol of uh, Istanbul's conquest. It was turned into a museum in 1934 uh, by a decree uh, from the cabinet of ministers, uh, which, which had Ataturk's signature, the founder of Turkish Republic. Uh, with this museumification process, Hagia Sophia became a symbol of multi-layered past of Istanbul and Turkey. Um, it became um, a symbol of the ethos of the newly formed Republic, which put uh, respect to its past and um, equal citizenship rights at its core. Uh, now in July, uh, Erdogan signed a presidential decree annulling uh, the decision to turn Hagia Sophia into a museum and announced his decision to convert Hagia Sophia into a functioning mosque. This act uh, prioritizes one identity of this multi-layered, multi-faith monument um, over all other identities. While Erdogan promised that the building will be accessed, will be open for access by all members of all religions, um, this act nevertheless fundamentally changes the state's relation both to its heritage as well as its citizens. In terms of heritage, Turkey now um, ceases to be the custodian of this very important um, monument of multi-faith coexistence and becomes the conqueror um, of heritage. And in terms of its citizens, 
it creates a dichotomy between the conquerors and the conquered. Uh, the act itself undermines the crucial principle of equal citizenship. And uh, nobody has uh, stated it more eloquently than uh, Archbishop Elfidophoros of the Greek Archdiocese of America, who is a Turkish citizen um, himself and from Istanbul. And um, with following this conversion, he says, um, a mentality of conqueror and claiming conqueror's rights changes the relationship of the states with its own citizens. And he followed, I am not a conquered minority. I want, I want to feel in my own country as an equal citizen. Um, most alarming um, in this conversion of Hagia Sophia, along with other uh, similar monuments, is the dominant rhetoric and policy that revolves around the idea of conquest. Um, and it uh, sets a dangerous trend as well as a dangerous precedent for um, not only uh, for Turkey, but in the larger Middle East. Um, Erdogan stated that this conversion uh, was done um, to gratify the spirit of conquest by Mehmet II. Um, Turkish government officials, including the head of Turkey's Directorate of Religious Affairs, which also represents all, is supposed to represent all re religions within Turkey, um, followed this rhetoric uh, of conquest. And this uh, rhetoric of conquest permeated to all levels of society, um, bringing uh, questions of you know, um, hate crimes and hate attacks uh, on minority communities. Um, Erdogan used the word right of the sword that uh, in the 15th century, this monument was taken with the sword as, a as um, an item of conquest. And we now hold um, the uh, right to this monument. Um, so this provides not only a polarizing discourse, but also a supremacist rhetoric. Um, Erdogan's speech when he was um, announcing the, uh, the conversion of Hagia Sophia uh, uh, contained a couple of very provocative sentences, including, um, I quote, resurrection of Hagia Sophia heralds the liberation of Al-Aqsa Mosque, end of quote. And he also called for all Muslims from Bukhara to Andalusia. Um, so this kind of um, a rhetoric around a single monument um, that not only uh, prioritizes one group of its citizens, the majority, overall minorities, but it also um, creates a larger uh, dynamic in which um, the extremists and supremacists across the Middle East would be emboldened. And uh, it was not a surprise to many of us that uh, the one of the first countries to congratulate uh, Erdogan um, was Iran. Uh, on his conversion, and he also received uh, praise from uh, Muslim Brotherhood and Hamas, also extremists in the Middle East. So um, building up on um, Shadi and Farahnaz's comments that in this region, um, the road to peace goes through pluralism. And pluralism is not only precious, but it is vital for these communities. And such acts not only um, create a very problematic environment for people to coexist together, but puts the lives of minorities um, in great danger. Thank you. Thank you, Tuba, very much. I mean, really a fantastic um, both regional and domestic view of, of uh, Turkey and President Erdogan. Um, maybe we'll do a quick lightning round. I just want to hear from all of you. You know, the, the, the title of this seminar was, is there a spark of hope or more entrenched uh, um, uh, extremism. You know, we've heard obviously from all of you um, both sides of that. Uh, but given the present elections in the U.S., as Ali said, I know that all the uh, people of the Middle East are watching these elections very closely. Let's do a quick turnaround and just tell me what what are your uh, views? Do you think this is a moment of hope, or are you more uh, positive or negative? And what are what do you think the uh, but minorities of the Middle East are hoping to get out of the presidential elections. Which side are they, you know, um, campaigning for or um, buying for? And how do they see uh, the presidential elections impacting them? But a quick round, because I want to get to questions. Maybe we'll start with Farinaz and, and go around pretty quickly, please. Um, I, I definitely think there is a spark of hope 
with the UAE Israel Bahrain moment, I think it's a huge and historic moment. But my only caveat is, and where I disagree with Sam, is I don't think the Arab Street, if we're really talking about Egypt, if we're really talking about not just Arab Street, but Middle East Street, we're talking about Iran, we're talking about Jordan, we're talking about Egypt, we're talking about Saudi Arabia. Can the Saudi royals join in this effort because their people are in a very different headspace to the people of the UAE? So I hope and I pray, and I do think uh, the leadership um, that has taken these decisions has thought long and hard for this moment. And they know Iran and Turkey are on their heels and they need to stand up. But let's hope that the United States and other countries in the region stand with them so the spark of hope can actually become something to help all minorities as equal citizens in their own countries. Great. Uh, Sam, where, where do you land? Uh, I think the, the sandstorm that started in the region in 2011 has not settled yet. We're still in the middle of this sandstorm. So we're seeing the winds blow in each direction. We're seeing positive things like the, the peace agreements between the UAE, Bahrain, and Israel. We're seeing alarming developments, Iran's role in the region, Turkey's, the, the role that the media in Turkey plays, especially Muslim Brotherhood runs one in incitement against minorities, against the idea of peace in the region. I think it's too early to say where the region is going to settle. But we clearly see these forces fighting each other as we speak in the region every day. Thank you. Shadi? Personally, as my observation, since we at uh, the Multiface Alliance do a lot of work with minorities in northern Iraq and northern Syria, that I, I think minorities in general tend to go with the majority in their area because, but in general, they are very sympathetic to Israel because they see Israel as some kind of a minority country in the sea of Arab and Muslim around us. So there is an opening there and I think minorities are very welcome of opening to Israel. But one last thought where I think that is the biggest hope. We worked, for instance, for two years, and that's very important. We worked with the Sunni Arab majorities across the border from the Golan Heights. We implemented a program for two years where we worked with the Israeli government and army to bring aid into Syria. And the transformation we saw into these two years with direct engagement between Israelis and Syrians was tremendous. The positive attitude after a year from when we started the program was tremendous. And even after the, the Russians and the Iranians and Syrian regime took over the area, we continued communications with the people we worked with who stayed there and their attitude was, we had the best two years of our lives. And they, they all wished that it could come back. So engagement, seeing economic prosperity, seeing uh, healthcare, everything, you know, schools, everything was running very good and they had more, more opportunities of work is very encouraging. You can turn people with engagement, they see the difference between their current regimes that are oppressive and not giving them this opportunity and the opportunities they can see with engagement with a, a democratic country like Israel. Thank you. Great. Ali, I'd love to hear your point. And I want to also direct one of the questions that's come in for you. How aware, um, one of our viewers is asking, are the majority populations in Iran about the plight of minorities in Iran, like, such as the Baha'is? Do you think the average Iranian Shiite uh, citizen knows how the minority Baha'is, for example, are being treated in their own country? Uh, I'll Feel free to, to answer both. Feel free to answer both. Okay, well, very quickly then. I'll try to combine the both. Uh, I think the good news is there's a lot of pressure on the Islamic Republic. Of course, the pub public in Iran, the regular person, is also under a lot of pressure. Um, and I think the really good news is that um, people in Iran and elsewhere in the region are turning away from the Islamic Republic's model of intolerance on a lot of issues from Israel to the Baha'is, as your viewer question. And the answer is yes. Uh, people in Iran are very well aware of what's happening in terms of religious minorities. Uh, 
a lot of Persian language television stations based from outside of Iran broadcast uh, programs about these issues to Iranian viewers. And there are even debates uh, in Iran and even public debates on these issues, like the treatment of the Baha'is. Um, I think hope is such a loaded term. I, I'm just very reluctant to use it. But um, I think the issue is that in terms of human rights and religious minority rights, uh, both the Democratic and Republican parties uh, have a tendency to want to withdraw from the Middle East or decrease their role in the region. I think this has always been really bad for minorities in general, uh, because I think if America withdraws from the region um, and you have the Islamic Republic and Erdogan's Turkey and China and Russia, some of the worst human rights abusers in the world, uh, reigning supreme, supreme in the region. And my current concern personally is that uh, if you know Biden wins and he returns to the JCPOA, that smashes the issue of human rights. Uh, it will get neglected for sure, as it was during the Obama administration. I think uh, human rights and religious rights defenders should be very aware of that going forward. Thank you, Ali. And, and Tuba, I'll turn to you. I'd love Tuba also for you to answer that question, but also bring in the Europeans a little bit. Turkey is a NATO um, member. So where are the Europeans? Why haven't we heard from them on some of these issues? The Europeans have always been so strong on human rights, at least the narrative has been very strong. If you could just touch on kind of the your role of the Europeans and what can we expect from them? While Turkey was on the track for um, EU accession, um, a lot of things had been improving. So that gave Turkey some incentive to do what's right. But at the same time, um, things have changed dramatically over the last two decades. And now um, Turkey's EU accession is no longer um, an, an something uh, that Turkey looks forward to uh, with the um, region in crisis and increasing um, human mobility across the region with the refugees. Um, Europe has a different relationship with Turkey um, than it used to as well. Um, so um, it has been, um, Europe has kept a lot more silent on issues that actually really relates to Europe too, um, than it should have. Um, and some of this pressure would have been really good in terms of keeping Turkey in the right track. Again, as a model country for the Middle East, Turkey is really important and Turkey's democracy is precious. Absolutely. And obviously, I think uh, President Erdogan knows that it's holding a very important card vis-a-vis -vis Europeans, and that is all the refugees from Syria and Iraq that are in its borders. And actually, it has used language to, you know, threatening Europeans um, with releasing these um, refugees onto Europe, the biggest fear of uh, European leaders. So uh, the situation is, is quite, quite grim in terms of what will this European-Turkish uh, dynamic look like. Um, we have come to, to the end of our webinar. There's so much more to talk about. I want to take this opportunity to thank each and every one of our task force members who themselves, their work is tremendous. Every day they're out there raising the uh, issues that we've talked about um, regarding their own uh, communities that they represent in regarding issues that they've been fighting for for decades. Um, as scholars, as activists, as researchers, as journalists. So we thank each and every one of you for being with us today, being part of the ADL task force. And we want to thank our audience for being with us today. We hope that this uh, hopefully will bring in some hope and, and that we can continue to look at the future and the next uh, year and days uh, ahead as maybe a change in the dynamic in the Middle East. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Sean. At this time, our briefing is finished. Thank you for joining us and have a good day. And to those who are celebrating, have a happy new year.